it out that the sun shines down its power to all the world and makes the wind blow strong as it will. I want to hope gentle rains can fall upon the land so lovely earth can stay lovely still. Hello, ladies and gentlemen. This is another edition of Energy Week with George Harvey and Tom Fennell. Hello, hello. We have two guests, Rhiannon and Chris, hello. who have come to us from Bensonwood, a most remarkable uh, company that is in, what's it called? Walpole. <laughs> no, Tom Walpole. says it. Walpole. <laughs> let's do this right. Let's, let's give people consideration and pronounce things the way they do. <laughs> Okay, we laugh a lot on this show, for, in, in case you don't know. We're going to click and clack of energy. <laughs> Dear. Okay, so we're going to run through the, uh, the news for the week. And for those who are new to this, I do a blog every day. I look for 10 or 15 news items. And I usually look through two or 300, 400 sometimes. I think I've gone to 500 news items each day, uh, looking for the ones that I think are the most interesting. And so we start with the news from a, a week ago tomorrow, which means Friday, September 25th, and we got this. From Transmission and Distri Distribution World, a new, new report from Nav Navigant Research examines the global demand response market with a with focus on t two key sectors. I'm tripping over my tongue commercial, industrial, and residential. The report says that the total worldwide capacity of demand response programs is expected to grow from 30.8 gigawatts in 2014 to 196.6 gigawatts in 2023. And I think that's really significant. Mm -hmm. um, for anybody who doesn't understand this, demand response. I was going to ask you about that. You were. <laughs> I thought you knew all about it. I was going to ask you. Um, what happens here is in a smart grid, for example, if you have a freezer and the freezer is, um, or a hot water heater is probably a better example. If you have a hot water heater that's demanding um, power, it, it would be nice for it not to take power during the, during the peak power load period. Mm -hmm. And in a demand response uh, system that's fully blown, you could have a peak demand period in which you're paying for power at a, at, a, at a function of the spot price of power, which means that you could cut your, 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 your uh, power bill significantly if you have your water heater off and can heat it up at night. And the, and the smart grid has that capacity to communicate between the, the uh, grid that knows what the current price is and your water heater. You can also have a car on this, for example, an EV that can feed power onto the grid so you can actually make money by charging your car at low grid rates and letting the grid take power at high grid rates, if that's what and you do. And of course, you, the customer, control this. You permit them to... You permit them to they, do it. You can drive, tell. You can say... You. That's right. You can <laughs> say, I want this car only to be charged when the... You could actually say, I only want this char car to charge when the price of power goes negative. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, which it does sometimes. It wouldn't around here very much, but you can say, I want this car to charge when the price of power is below two cents per kilowatt hour. I want it to... I want it to take go to the grid when the price of power on the grid goes <coughs> above twenty cents per kilowatt hour. There was a or whatever. What was that thing? In, was it in Delaware where the guy plugged in a uh, uh, an EV and found that just by leaving it in, he under, was making a he was making one hundred and fifty dollars a month. <laughs> <Yeah>. <coughs> Just by plugging his car in. <laughs> <laughs> we're, we're coming into a new world. Okay, that was from uh, Transmission and Distribution World. The next one is from Business Green. The International Renewable Energy Agency, which you'll see occasionally as IRENA, has a paper that predicts an auspicious future for sustainable biomass outlining the total biomass demand could reach 108 exajoules worldwide. <laughs> I, for, I, I had trouble with exit <laughs> Well, I'm not even going to go into that because I, I can't do it. I got the answer here. Oh, do you? Up, Good for you. <laughs> the, the prefix EXE represents a factor of 10 to the 18th power. Oh, my goodness gracious. 
And That's a lot. And just, just to help everybody else, because I needed it, a joule is equal to the energy used to accelerate a body with a mass of one kilogram using one newton of force. One newton. Over a distance of one meter. <laughs> <laughs> and a newton is the force necessary to provide a mass of one kilogram with an ex acceleration of one meter per second per second. I, it's so <laughs> obvious. <laughs> Why are we even talking about this? satisfied with exajoules, there are two groups that are bigger than that. Zetajoules and yada joules. Y yada, yada, yada. <laughs> okay, this, re this could represent 60% of the total global renewable energy use if the potential is realized. Okay. Okay, so that's a... That's a <laughs> okay, I'm going to go on from there. Business Spectator says, following Google, f f Facebook has cut ties with the American Legislative Exchange Council, bringing the number of corporations that have done so to at least 87. Facebook and Google's high-profile departure from ALEC will likely put pressure on corporations still sending funds to the conservative group, Actually, this such is as sleeper. Yahoo this is, this and is, email. This, is, this means some of the big guys who've been throwing They're, their money into the Koch brothers are saying that this is bad business. Yeah, and as a matter of fact, we're going to have uh, Google, the, the CEO of Google's comments on this in a... In a in a later we we touch base with this we later. do it yep. we do indeed so let's go on from there our next one is from september 27th which is saturday fresh statistics from the department of energy and climate change this is in the uk estimate renewables met a record-breaking 46.4 percent of electric use in 2013 up from 39.9 in 2012 this is not in the uk it's in scotland mm -hmm. The Scottish government says this indicates Scotland is on track to meet its target of 50% by 2015 and 100% by 2020. Utility okay. products gave us that one. Parenthetically, this is interesting. Almost half of Scotland's electricity consumption now comes from renewable energy. Yeah. Sources. Almost half. Almost half. And the amount of, this is the part I find interesting. The amount of green energy generated in the country now rose by almost a third in the last year, thanks to bad weather. <laughs> <laughs> but they always have bad weather in Scotland. My daughter is living in Scotland now, and she's living in Glasgow and loves it. And she says, she, I talked to her last, I think it was almost a year ago, I think it was in December, uh, and she said, the weather in Scotland is, is amazing. She said, it, the sun goes up at 9, it sets at 3, and it rains all day. <laughs> <laughs> she said, the, there, is a, there is a solution to that, and it involves whiskey. Okay. <laughs> all right, that was from Utility Products. Next is from Fierce Energy. As increasing levels of solar, wind, geothermal, and biomass are integrated into the grid, Utility hiring is impacted. Solar, however, has the most employees averaging 41 full-time equivalent employees per 100 megawatts of photovoltaic connections versus 12 per 100 megawatts of that's, total that's renewable energy. That's got me energy. scratching my head. What do these guys do? They clean the glass? I, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. But it's an interesting thing. Fierce, I'm not going to argue energy. about the numbers. So I'm sure they're real. But Fierce Energy. Guys. <clears throat> 100 megawatts. That's a, that's a lot of employees. It's a lot of a lot of that's, employees. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. It is, I think, possibly less though than what they have in nuclear. There was. Well, yeah, it says 612. Well, no, that's total renewable. Yeah, I I don't have. Vermont and Yankee had roughly one person per megawatt, but I'm not sure why. And I know that that includes security personnel who you wouldn't expect to be employed at a solar farm. I don't, okay. I don't think they usually need to the solar farms. But. You, you never can tell. Away. Yeah, you got to keep the birds away. Hire a few, I don't know, <laughs> squirrels to keep the nuts off the ground so the birds don't come in. Well, I know dirt on a solar panel uh, can reduce the... Um, oh, yeah. Heck yeah. By, by, you got to keep clean. By 3 to 5%, just having a light layer of dirt on it. So. However... You can cover it with tungsten dioxide... Uh, uh, Titanium. titanium. Titanium dioxide, dioxide. And, the, and the dirt will just wash off in the rain. 
How do you like so, uh, like that self cleaning glass? <laughs> now there's only 39 employees for me. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Okay. Um, next from oh that was from Fierce Energy, wasn't it? The next is from the Energy Collective. Whoop! It went off my screen. What? Where did it go? Wow! I really did a lot of a lot of damage to that one. Okay. There it is. In the state of New York, a looming power supply shortage is spurring regulatory action to, supply, to support a smarter, less centralized, more robust power grid. The initiative could revolutionize the utility industry in that state while solving the supply problem in both functional and business sense, that from the Energy Collective. And we will hear more about New York State, I believe, too. Is that, is that right, Tom? I don't remember now. I think we do. But the next one after that is from the Brattleboro Reformer. Get to this before you can't get to it anymore. That's what I couldn't get to. Oh, you couldn't. <laughs> I'm sorry to hear that. The, the, um, the Reformer doesn't uh, keep its, its back articles up for everybody for, for more than a week. Uh, they do with some articles. But I couldn't I, even get into the Reformer website. Oh, well. I they did. Were just too busy. And this, this is what I. Maybe they were busy because people knew about this. Energy <laughs> expects to complete a detailed decommissioning assessment for Vermont Yankee plant in the next 30 days. Also, Energy has slightly revised its schedule for moving the plant's spent fuel into more stable dry cask storage, saying it will be done by 2020. Well, that's encouraging. For, yeah. At least they're talking about it. They're they're definitely talking about it. Okay. Sunday, September 28th, Elon Musk will soon be building what amounts essentially to another gigafactory. This one in New York State as a, a recent agreement with the government there. This time it is a manufacturing plant that will produce more than a gigawatt of solar panels each year. This is a biggie. Mm -hmm. I mean, Elon Musk owns Tesla. Well, it controls Tesla, certainly. Owns and controls. Solar City is owned and controlled by his cousin. Yeah, and I think he's <laughs> on the board. They talk to each other. They talk to each other. <laughs> and so they're making cars. They're making batteries. They're going to be making uh, solar panels. Solar panels. Yep. And apparently, they got some uh, technological advantages here. It's a pretty good system mm -hmm. uh, for making the panels. And you know what Elon Musk said? He said, "I'm not in this for the money. I want to save the world." Did he say that? Yes. <laughs> you know, I, I believe him. This is this is fun you to know, see, if, see if, this kind uh, of thing. What's his name? Coke said that I wouldn't believe him, but uh. well, I yeah. <laughs> you know, I've been thinking about those guys for crying out loud. They're all over seventy. They're all billionaires, yeah. and they're all trying to make as much money as they possibly can <laughs> by preventing other people from making money. What is this? Are they expecting to live forever? I wouldn't be surprised. <laughs> hey, how old is well, David Rockefeller? I think he's ninety-five now. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. Okay, that was from Clean Technica. The next one from the Oneida Dispatch. Well, this I think this is the first one I found from the Oneida Dispatch. Federal en energy regulators have given final approval for construction to a 330-mile electric transmission line to carry lower-cost Canadian hydroelectric power to New York City. Actually, this is pretty interesting because this yeah. is all going to be on pretty much all underwater. Yeah, and you know who complained about it? Energy. <laughs> it's going to they were complaining because this, this line, which is crossing the Hudson River, mm -hmm. right near the Indian Point power plant, it is, yes. was going to disturb the fish. Oh, well, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> do, you, do, you, do you remember the big argument that they had between Entergy and, I forget, I think it was the, the Environmental Agency in New York? about the number of fish the Indian plant, point plant kill every year. And the question was, was it, uh, was it 100 million fish a year, which is what Entergy claimed, or was it the billion fish a year? <laughs> and you know, the, I, I mentioned that to a woman who was in the, in the fisheries in, in uh, service in Vermont, and she said, yeah, you know what they're killing is fry. Yeah, yeah. And we're talking about fish that are about, you know, an eighth of an inch long. They look like a whisker with eyeballs on one end. <laughs> Let's revisit this a second because yeah. there's a second half of this 
that you haven't mentioned, which yeah. is important too. The developers of the Champlain Hudson Power Express, which is what we're talking about here, yeah. have also proposed the New England Clean Power Link, a 150 mile, 1,000 megawatt transmission cable also under Lake Champlain from Canada to Vermont. Well, there you go. Okay, it's connecting up around Ludlow. Yeah. Connecting with the Vermont grid. Although, you know, if you look at the, if you look at the, I was just doing the speed reports for Green Energy Times and uh, for an article for, for Green Energy Times that I'm writing right now. And uh, what I'm seeing is that speed, the, the sustainable power blah, 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 program, um, is, has a target of 20% of our electric supply by 2017 coming That's from renewable, renewable power in Vermont that is not net metered and is not off grid. <clears throat> and that means, you know, this is a su substantial amount of power. It doesn't include the old hydro dams. And, okay. and so, you know, it, it may be half or less of the, of the total power that we're generating in Vermont and they are already to 16 percent. And when I, when I looked at that, <clears throat> it's hard to get the, 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 um, the, the statistics down on this because there's so, everybody is excluding something. And it, but I went to the U.S. Um, Energy Information Agency, which is an agency that <clears throat> produces, I think, fairly uniformly bad numbers. But they, they, um, they said that Vermont Yankee produces 73% of the power generated in Vermont now. Okay. They're winding that down. They're down to 95% power now as they're, okay. as they're going down. And um, the remainder is almost all renewable. And, th and that 73% provides no power to Vermont, but it represents about 80 I, 83 or so percent of, of the power demand for Demont, Vermont. And the result of that is, by doing a little algebra, I can come up with, a, with their estimate of what the, the actual percentage of power. Okay. And there, it comes to about 34 percent of Vermont's power is already in state, already in state, state renewable. renewables. And we're talking about the speed program taking us up to 55% by 2035. So we've got, you know, we're- We're, we're on the track. We're kind, yeah, we could do better, but we're on track. Yeah. I'd like to revisit this one very briefly. There's an old power cable engineer. Yeah. Uh, this, this thrills me. I've been seeing underwater power cables taking the place of these huge overland transmission lines. Oh yeah. It's underwater, but it's going to be buried in a trench underwater. It's not just going to be lying there. Yeah. You know, so it's going to be protected. It's going to be pretty safe. Uh, no, no one's going to be able to. You're not going to be able to shoot this thing out with shoot your. Shoot the thing with, out yeah, by accident. By accident. Because, accident, like, because yeah. these, these uh, insulators look like nice things to shoot at. <laughs> oh, don't say that. Oh, my goodness gracious. <laughs> and I also, I cut nice my things. eye teeth on power cables with a power underwater power line, yeah. 138,000 volts, from Indian <laughs> Point to Orange and Rockland Utilities on the other side of the river. Really? Yeah, and that was pushing the state of technology at that time. Really? Yeah, it really was, 138 kV. Now they're up to uh, a megawatt, a, a, a megavolt. A megavolt. DC, uh. they're using the, you know, I don't that think would, anything like that. Can you fry this. fish with a meg megavolt? <laughs> <laughs> I think you'd turn them into carbon dioxide just like that. But you're going to see more and more cables and less and less overland trips. Well, we've seen we've seen future. these big cables coming up in the news. They were talking about that one that goes from Denmark to Belt ne the Netherlands. It's about that big. Yeah, and then <laughs> we're seeing them coming from the the outer Hebrides to Scotland and yep, from Scotland yep. to Wales and And there they have no choice. You're not going to build a transmission line in the middle well, of the Atlantic Ocean. Well, you know that island in Scotland where they they had the the entire island was diesel powered and the yeah. and the generator only ran about 10 hours a day. <laughs> what's what's the oh, name dear. of that island? So you have egg. Three letters. Egg. egg. Yeah. But it's not EGG, it's, it's like EIG. E -I -G. Yeah. yeah. Egg. Yeah. That's fun. And now they've got, you know, now they've got wind power and batteries and they've got power 24-7. Wow. And when the, they only use their generator, when the, your diesel generator, when there's a problem. Okay. Um, 
Monday, September 29th, Saskatchewan's government-owned power utility is set to launch a carbon <laughs> capture and storage project this week. Sask Power says it is the world's first and largest. If it's the world's first, it's got to be the largest. Got to be the largest. <laughs> um, commercial scale carbon capture operation of its kind and will capture carbon dioxide emissions from burning coal to store them deep underground. That from Financial Post. I don't know that I trust this deep underground well, storage. I got a picture of uh, what they're Look going at that. to do. Oh my goodness gracious. Now, most of the stuff you're seeing on the left is on their property. They're going to pipe it. They're, they're going to pipe it through, uh, through pipes. Yes. To somebody down in Texas who's going to put oh. it down in the coal mines or the oil mines. Oil wells. Oil wells to push more oil out. Oh. And then further on, uh, they're going to pipe it to somebody who's going to put it way, way underground into salt mines. Well, okay, so they're going to use this carbon they're capturing from the oil, from the coal, to drive out more oil. Yeah. So that the oil can produce more carbon <laughs> more that carbon. won't be captured. <laughs> and then what's going to happen is 20 years from now, some pipe is going to spring a leak and they're going to wind up having dry ice sp spraying all over the place. <laughs> I don't trust it. Right, well, I'm, I'm a little bit skeptical about the how putting stuff way underground in the salt mine and having it stay there. Having it, you know, the, the use of the salt mines in Utah? Yeah. I'm a little bit worried about that because they could crack one of those things and they'd leak air yeah. all over the place. <laughs> <laughs> but do you know about that, Rihanna? About the The salt mines in Utah, the thing that they're doing there? It was just recently announced. There's a, is it 2.1 gigawatt? I think that's what it is. <clears throat> There's a couple of big wind farms that are being developed in Wyoming. Yeah. One's three gigawatts and the other's 2.1. And the 2.1 gigawatt wind farm, they are putting in a transmission line that transmits the, the output of that to Utah, where it will be used, the power will either be passed on or, or it will be used to compre highly compress air to, for storage in Salt, in, um, salt, dome. salt do domes. They have these big caverns from brine extraction of salt domes that are, you know, a quarter of a mile tall and... Very large bottles. Three, yeah, very large bottles. And then it's going to get compressed, put in there, and then later it comes out, and the power that it generates is transmitted. They're, they're talking about Los Angeles in that particular case. The other one, the, the other big one, is just transmitting power direct from Wyoming to San Diego. But uh, that's, that's what I was referring to, storing the air underground, I think, is... I'm a little worried about that because I'm, I'm worried about this business of putting pressure on, taking pressure off. Putting pressure on, taking pressure off. It's going to happen on a daily basis and I think that you, we could have a failure in that system. But if we have a failure, it means a lot of air gets blown all over the place. <laughs> okay. Um, and the next one, carbon emissions in the U.S are higher than expected for 2014. Carbon dioxide emissions for consumption of coal were more than 12% higher during the first half of 2014 than during the first six months of 2012, while those from natural gas and petroleum rose by 7.3% and 0.8% respectively. This is from Business Green, and there was an article that I did not include in today's items but it was in the news today where the US DOE is saying the reason is because the price of natural gas is going up and this means that the, co the, the um, utilities are turning back to coal. Okay. I, it's, I'm not surprised. I'm not surprised. That's what happens when people have got money is the bottom line. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Next one is from oilprice.com. Unsatisfied with the pace at which the federal government is acting to reduce greenhouse gas emissions, several U.S. states are forging ahead with their own initiatives. This, the first year of the California program was a resounding success, with the state's ex economy expanding while at the same time adding renewable energy. That's not a surprise to me. Now we've got a bunch of stuff from, from Tuesday. Think, I'm sorry, Big Think. Modern lithium batteries have come with their own environmental ba baggage. Yeah, you've got to get the lithium. You've got to dispose of it when you're done, which probably means recycling, although the, the article said 
sending it to a landfill. I don't think anybody would s send lithium uh, to a if, landfill. If it's a metal, it's recyclable, yeah. and it will be recycled. Lithium is not, is not free. Scientists at Sweden's Uppsala University, seeking a more eco-friendly alternative, have created a new smart battery made from organic materials that they say produces m just as much power as its lithium counterpart part and is recyclable. That seems like it's a You've got a picture of this? This is, they're, they're talking about a battery that has components that are made from pine resin and seeds. <laughs> you get so much pine resin. <laughs> <laughs> what can we do? Ah. Very cool. Yeah. Gotta, gotta save our pine trees, though. We have to save our <laughs> pine trees, yes. Okay, now, the Natural Resources Defense Council came up with this one. It's a, 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 um, uh, an opinion piece. The title is Alec Fane's Leap Off Faltering Climate Denial Bandwagon, semicolon, fools <laughs> no one. <laughs> the American Legislative Exchange Council had a really bad week coming under fire for its climate denial. A tip the typically secretive Alec answered with a cringe-inducing uh, position statement on climate and renewable energy, and I have to tell you, I read that statement, and it is cringe-inducing. And uh, maybe that was the other thing that we were talking about with we Alec. We referred to this further earlier on. We did indeed, uh, and people, are, people donors, yeah, are waking up to Alec. And saying and, it's not good business. And the, we talked about this last week. The, mm -hmm. the CEO of Google said, um, basically, he said, they're lying. They're lying, <laughs> they're lying yeah. and they're making things the worse for everybody. I, I think that includes themselves. Um, the next item from Clean Technica, unless you, we've got more to throw at Alec. Well, I just read, read what I have here. Alec is making this. This, this is the guy you just talked to. Talk yeah. about. Alec is making the false claim in its new position statement that the NRDC, NRDC agrees with one of the group's anti-solar <coughs> proposals. Oh, Boy, yes. were we surprised to hear that because we don't agree with Alec. <laughs> That's the NRDC. Yeah. The They've NRDC actually demanded a return. against Alec's, Alec's proposal to apply fixed charges to rooftop solar customers. And by the way, I got a little sideline on that. I think it was Arizona, it might have been New Mexico. They applied and got the right to uh, put a fixed solar charge. They wanted a thousand dollars a year. They got five. <laughs> five dollars. <laughs> Not five thousand, five dollars. Okay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, and and there were, uh, I think there were two states in the last week that ha where the utilities had tried doing this and then they backed off because people were so upset. And I, I can't blame people for being upset. You know, I think you'll agree with me, though, on this, Tom, and that is that eventually, and I'm actually hoping for this, we're going to come to a point where the utilities are going to have to charge connect fees for those, for those solar systems because the solar systems are going to be so important that they won't have any way to keep them connected unless they charge some sort of connect fee. Um, okay. The next item is from Clean Technica. The Tehachapi, I don't know how to pronounce that. Maybe That's Chris does. Tehachapi? <laughs> I'll give you that one. Okay. Energy storage project, the biggest battery energy storage project to date in North America has now opened. The 32 megawatt hour battery energy to storage system built by Southern California Edison has a lithium has lithium ion batteries stationed in a special 6300 square root uh, square root square foot facility uh, in a substation in Tehachapi California That picture California. is of the substation. Oh, okay. <laughs> it looks just it looks like a big corridor with uh, lockers. Mm. Yeah, it looks like and it, there are the batteries. It looks like a law office library. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah, well, that's interesting. But the, the, the good point there is this is in close proximity to the wind resource area. Yes. So they're going. There you they're go. anticipating a lot of wind power. Well, that they want to store. Yep. Okay, and now we're on to Wednesday. This is yesterday, the first of October, and this yesterday there was just a lot of stuff that came. So we have four items from yesterday. Business Spectator told us this: that synthetically produced hydrogen. Oh, I love this one. You have to talk more about this one because I oh. didn't pick anything up on it. Yeah, but but it, this is this is mind-boggling. 
Synthetically produced hydrogen can store huge amounts of power. Germany will require 30 terawatt hours of storage capacity, and you, we don't care what a terawatt hour it's a is. Lot. It's a lot, and it's what they need, 30 of, to be able to run their nation on 100% on renewably powered uh, electricity. Existing gas infrastructure can store up to 200 terawatt hours, which is six and two thirds times what they need in gas generated. Wind plants with the ability to store energy as hydrogen are already being set up. That means that they don't need the batteries. Mm. It's if just, they, it's it's another storage. way of storing. It's a different it's way of storing. It's electro, through electrolysis of water. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Hydrogen. Yeah. And you know, there's been a lot of there's been a lot of work on that uh, electrolysis in the last couple of years. It's an old, old, old technology, and they've just been looking for more efficient ways to do it that are less damaging to the electrodes and you know whatever it is but it's it's fascinating to see this develop because you know the people who have been saying well we we can't do very much with renewable power until we've got the storage thing taken care of and the storage thing is being taken care of ladies and gentlemen it is being taken care of okay from the Burlington Free Press, we got this, a long-term plan to eliminate dependence on fossil fuels in Vermont's capital of Montpelier is getting a boost from two new projects, one to install more solar panels on an insurance company and another to meet more heating needs with a new biomass heating facility. What do you got on that, Tom? Anything? Well, I got a picture of you got uh, a picture, some biomass. You got a picture of biomass. <laughs> Right. I got a picture of biomass too. It's got my face on it. <laughs> yeah, solar, pa solar panels on the insurance company is a biggie. I, I, I read that one, but I wasn't aware of the new biomass heating facility. Well, you know, some of these things, is, some of these things just happen without people really paying attention to them. They, we had that biomass heating facility that they were proposing for North Springfield that was shot down. Then we have another one that's proposed for Montpelier, and nobody really noticed. Oh, this, this biomass heating plant they're talking about was the one that they finished last spring in Montpelier. Okay. Okay, so it's coming online just in Oh, it's coming online. Day. All right. So the fight to fight against this that other people would have done would have been over long ago if they were going to we'll do start it. Start providing steam for the upcoming heating season. So it's a... Uh, it's a steam generating plant. Steam yeah, is it, such it, interesting <laughs> stuff. People don't think about how interesting steam is. Well, you they're know, going to be heating all the buildings downtown with yeah, the steam right. produced by this biomass plant. The amount of energy that it takes to heat up water is amazing. Yes, it is. And the amount of energy that comes out when you allow that water to cool down is the same as the amount that goes into it. Goes back in. And I tell people this. <clears throat> if you take a piece of ice at 32 degrees, a gram of ice at 32 degrees Fahrenheit, but it's ice and you put in the energy to melt that ice, and then you put in the energy, I should, I should talk about zero degrees Celsius here, really. You take it to 100 degrees Celsius, and then you boil it. All right, you got a gram of ice. All right, so if you take a gram of steel, and you put the same amount of energy into that steel, you won't want to look at it, because it'll be glowing so brightly. Mm -hmm. Because the amount mm -hmm. of, you know, it's it's just it's mind-boggling. It took me the longest time to figure out why it was so hard to heat up water, and of course, it all has to do with phase changes. Phase change, exactly. But the, yeah. well, the thing about water is that the phase change between between ice and steam is going on continuously as you heat it up, because when it's water at zero degrees Celsius, it's not H two O. It's six H two O. Oh. I didn't know that. When you get up to the point of boiling, you've finally got it to H2O, and it, it is, it's a continuous thing in between. So it's really hard to heat up, it's really hard to cool off, and guess what? That's why we can survive on the Earth, because we are full of water. It's quite <laughs> useful to us, isn't it? <laughs> it's beautiful. It's beautiful. Okay. And you can get all of that from the Burlington Free Press? And I got it from You can get it all from Energy Week. Okay. <laughs> Did did we say that we'd won an award? Yeah, oh, for, we, we will get there. All, we'll get there as we'll soon as I'm done with this. Is Here it is. <laughs> <laughs> this is our Oscar. Okay. 
Um, the next item is from Domestic Fuel. Michael Renan, a senior researcher from World Watch Institute, writes that nuclear energy's share of global power production has declined steadily from a peak of 17.6% in 1996 to 10.8% in 2013. Renewables increased their share from 18.7% in 2000 to 22.7% in 2012. What do you think of that? It's exciting. I'm having a hard time keeping up. <laughs> okay, I'll say it again. Numbers, 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 numbers. numbers. <laughs> Renewables are now producing more than twice as much power as nuclear. I think we're talking about just electric power here. I, I think that's fascinating. That's global. That's global. global. That's yep. global. Yeah, in the United States, our, our uh, electric supply is about 13, 14, 14 percent, 14.1, mm -hmm. I think was the last I saw, from, uh, from, from renewable power. Um, from renewables, and of course, we're getting a f significant amount of heat too. But um, it, we're we're lagging behind the rest of the world. We're starting to turn ourselves into a third world country. It's sad. These th these people from from Bensonwood, however, are going to save us, and I'm not kidding. Okay, <laughs> I'm looking forward to hearing it. <laughs> <laughs> California Governor Jerry Brown has signed an Environmental Defense Fund sponsored bill that accelerates the use of demand response. Now we talked about demand response before. A voluntary cost effective tool that relies on people and technology not polluting water, water intensive power, uh, not polluting water intensive power plants to meet the state's rising electricity needs. And just kind of to deal with this one more time, it's a matter of the, when you're talking about baseload power plants, mm -hmm. you've got to design your power plant to be able to deliver the maximum load. Mm -hmm. When you're talking about distributed power plants that are in a demand response system, the maximum load is reduced and, okay. and controllable so you can get to a really good match between um, demand, between and, demand supply. and supply. It's, it's a beautiful system, and they've got virtual power plants, which are just computers that are doing that by ter saying, you turn on, you turn off. Yep. You turn off, you turn off. Actually, they've been around for a long time, but they're getting much more sophisticated. They're getting very sophisticated. They've actually got them now where they've got the equivalent uh, of, of a nuclear power plant oper being a computer in Germany, which is just turning on and off various resources, mm -hmm. hydro, um, but solar and wind, you can fit, furl a wind turbine in, in moments. In seconds. Yeah, yeah <laughs> seconds. And you can unfurl it in seconds. So you, you can, can turn it on, you can turn it off. You can't unfurl a coal power plant. Though. No, it's true that you can't turn the wind power turbine on if there's no wind. Correct. But that only happens during the daytime it, when you've got sun turning, solar panels. It's not necessarily <laughs> generating. You can turn yeah. the generation on and off with a switch. Right. And and you know any system if you're going to go to full nuclear or full coal or a combination of it'll both take you hours it'll t it'll take it maybe days. days but on top of that you have to run at full load yep and and so you've got this built-in massive inefficiency that people who say we need base load power just don't understand mm -hmm. so sorry I'm <laughs> ranting again. I think Governor Brown needs to take a, a more uh, proactive step and, and put a moratorium on fracking in California. Oh boy, we could go. We could go a full. Yeah. We could go. We, we could. We could go program after program whole, talking whole about that one. I think but Chris, you're right about that. Is falling down. But Governor you, Cuomo, on the other hand, in New York, has, has done a great, great deal of uh, thinking about the issue and, and actually coming up with some policies. In the last week, they've announced a $50 billion initiative to cut their CO2 emissions or to be 80% yeah. by 2050 renewables. Yeah. This is it's stuff 20% that... shy of where we need to be, but... Well, you know, people ask me if, if I think that Vermont is going to be able to achieve the 90% by 2050. And that's 90% not just of our electricity, but of all of our energy. So that's energy needs, yep. that includes transportation and includes... Um, it includes uh, heat, 
and I say, you know, I really think we could if we could achieve 95% by 2035. I agree. Because mm -hmm. it's it's there, and and the beautiful the beautiful thing about this is we can save so much money by doing that. We can employ so many people by doing that. We can have better health. We can imp we can improve everything except one thing, and that is the incomes of the Koch brothers. <laughs> <laughs> I knew you were going to say that. <laughs> How did you know that? <laughs> you read my mind, Tom. It's just, it's, 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 no, oh, okay. That was from Renewables Biz. And now the last item, and I love this. This is today's news, and it's the only item I've got into for today. This is from Renewable Energy Magazine. Sun Edison announced. Sun Edison is a manufacturer of. It's not a. It's not a utility. Announced that its advanced polysilicon technology is now in production. It's in production now, and it is on target to produce solar material at low cost. The company claims this development is a single. Ste is a step change in technology and will enable it to deliver a 400 watt peak solar panel at a cost of 40 cents per watt peak by 2016. That's just around the corner and that's that's the solar panel for 40 cents and a watt. And that's only one approach to making solar panels. Oh, well, you know, we've There's talked about printing them. and people out there. <laughs> Coming up with their own ideas. Yeah. And I, I was just thinking this morning, what we're seeing in solar technology today is like the Model T Ford. That's an interesting thought. You know, in 50 years, what solar technology has evolved into will be almost unrecognizable. I think that's probably true. And there's still going to be the Model T Fords around. Yeah. But they're not going to be owned by the large panel operators, they're going to be the, owned by little guys who've bought them on a second-hand market. Just like I'm sure somewhere in Vermont, there's some guy still running a farm with a Model T Ford. <laughs> yeah, there probably is. I've known, recently I've known people, I knew a logger who, and the only reason I don't know him today is because I moved to Brattleboro and I don't live in the same town that I used to live in. But he was a logger and he made his money by bringing in logs from the woods and, and you know, uh, selling the wood, and he was entirely horse operated. Horse operated. Horse right. operated. Yeah. Well, actually, bringing logs out of the woods with a horse is sufficient. It's sufficient. Yeah. You know, you drag the, you, you tie the log to the horse, and the horse knows what to do. Yeah. Right. <laughs> and and the beauty of this system is, it's it's expensive to keep a horse, and it's expensive to buy a horse, but it's nowhere near as expensive as it is to buy and maintain a skitter. Those, yeah, those sure, things are absolutely. big pieces of equipment. Absolutely. I have no idea how much a skitter costs, but I'd, I'd be astonished if it was less than $100,000. And, and, you know, a horse, well, horses have a tendency to replicate themselves. It happens <laughs> automatically. <laughs> okay, the, my, my idea of the current status of, of, of solar power is that it's kind of like this. Whoops. I just had it, held it up. There it is. Yeah, there we go. Okay, that's an IBM laptop computer, and my first computer was a Radio Shack Model Three, <laughs> which had no disk drives at all, no floppy drive. It was, t you know, the the uh, storage was on cassette tapes. You could listen to them. <laughs> <laughs> and it had it had 16 kilobytes of RAM, and it had 32 kilobytes of ROM, and it cost a thousand dollars. And when you turned the power on, when that screen, which is a uh, CRT, came on, it was already booted. Oh yeah. Yeah, it was that fast. Wow. It was very very simple. Yeah. But. It was a 16 kilobyte machine with no storage that cost a thousand dollars. And you know what? <laughs> the first computer I worked with was an eight kilobyte machine 
that the school got for 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 used for one and a half million dollars. Oh wow! I could go on about that. <laughs> but when when I got my first IBM PC, there was it was a little bit before I got my first IBM PC. There, uh, I think it was Byte Magazine had a thing, and it might have been PC Magazine, and they were saying if the price of of um, Air transportation had gone as far, and you know, the change as the cost of computers from the time of 1960 or whatever to, uh, I think it was 1962 to 82. You would be able in 1982 to buy a Boeing 747 for seven dollars and sixty-eight cents <laughs> and fly, fly it around the world eight times in an hour. <laughs> Using one and a half gallons of aviation <laughs> fuel, <laughs> and just think about what it was like in 1982, and here we are in 2014. This machine it has got 10,000 times as much memory. It, the processor is 10,000 times as fast. Yeah, everything is. You know, 10, it's ten times at least. Yeah, and it costs less. And the only thing that it can't do. And it usually does it, but it can't do it all the time. That my old 16 kilobyte machine did it reliably was keep up with my typing. <laughs> <laughs> I touch type, you know. I have to admit it. It's I don't hunt and peck. Sorry, gang. Okay, Chris and Rhiannon, 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 Rhiannon. Okay. It's a difficult name for me because, <laughs> be, and oh, and I wanted to mention this. Oh yeah, we'll put. Tom and I won an Oscar. Congratulations. <laughs> Thank you so much. We, we got this for, what does it say? Series of the year. BCTV had its, had its um, annual, meeting, annual meeting last night and they gave out awards. And Is there a red carpet? No, it's blue. <laughs> <laughs> it was in this room. Oh. It was in this room. <laughs> it was a lot of fun. And there were a lot of people who got a lot of awards. You know, I can't claim that we were the only one or e even the most deserving, but. There's a lot of good people. Uh, there's a lot of good people involved in there. And it was, it was just a lot of fun to see the things that people had done. It was just, you, you saw Roland coming through here doing things. He has, um, he, each year he does a montage that tells what we, BCTV has done in the, in the preceding year. And he did one last night, which was fun to watch. It was an eight minute long thing. He did one last year, the year before, and the year before that. And of those three that he had done, two won national awards. Really? Yeah. There's not enough awards for that kid. You know, there, you know, I, I got up <laughs> that and guy is great. I said, you know, the, the person who really deserves this one is Roland Boyden <laughs> because he's great. He's absolutely great. And, um, you know, I've said also, it's, it's impressive to me to think that anybody who's got a, a reasonably good idea on a TV show that they would like to do can do it. Yeah. And basically it's free. Yeah. You know, we're getting into this, this collaborative commons thing that Jeremy Rifkin, the economist, talked about, where people are doing things and they're free. This show is produced for free. This show is distributed for free. I don't get paid. You don't get paid. Well, or one of the women that won an award last night, total amateur. Yeah. She wanted to see what she could do. She was proud of what was going on in her church on Sunday. They had a nice oh, party yeah. and all of that. <clears throat> so she put on a show. And she won an award for that, too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Another woman who won an award last night started doing... Um, uh, work um, less than a year ago as doing camera work and stuff like that. This was uh, Jan. Yeah. And she's a delightful person and she just picked this stuff up and went with it. And But, but they, they were talking about kids coming in and just picking the whole thing up and going with it and they can make shows. Kids in school can can make TV shows. And now, there's a program for the kids in school. Oh, there's a bunch of them. A bunch of they programs. BC Summer TV, camp. Uh, no. What is it? BUHS TV. Every morning the kids do a little news show. That's awesome. Yeah. I'm going to close this up. And now we're going to talk about Bensonwood. We have about 10 minutes in this show. And then, and then we can continue. So, um, 
Chris, you're going to tell me, or Rhiannon, you're going to tell me that Benson Wood's going to save the world. <laughs> well, that's why we are uh, in business, yes, to try to save the world. Um, what we are is a building company, first and foremost. And when Ted Benson started the company, he was searching for a better way to build. And um, that, that led him to the, the timber frames that are so prevalent in this area from the old barns that were built. Right. And this is an old way of building. It's, oh. it's, hey, Tom, you're going to get an education on this one. <laughs> yeah. You really are. I wrote an article on Ted Benson for Green Energy Times uh -huh. not that long ago. And you know, the, one of the first things that came into that, uh, into my mind when I started thinking about this was 30 years ago when I moved back to Winchester, New Hampshire, one of my neighbors was, uh, was in construction. And he was reading books about, or, or news articles or something about Ted Benson and what he was doing with timber frame at that time. But yes, he it's- was, He was really one of the um, primary players in the revival of the modern timber frame movement. But he built this in a way that is most remarkable because it's not, it's, it, it's very similar in structurally to what it would have been uh, 200 years ago. Oh yeah. But the business model is entirely different. <laughs> right. Well, I, I, our business model is actually a very different business where we are all part of the team. And mm -hmm. um, as, a, as a team, we can achieve more. It's the superorganism effect, so to speak. And, and he has really allowed the company to flourish as a democratic company. Where we all have input on what do we think the better way to build is, whether it's a different insulation system or a different roof system or a different delivery method or a new facility that we're building to, to prefabricate things. But he's always been interested in, in um, he, he took the timber framing and he brought it indoors and he, and he started a basically a prefabrication plant back in the 70s. Which, which is a very different thing from what most people think of when they think about prefabrication. Absolutely. This is architect designed. Absolutely. And, and that I think is impressive in itself. I mean, uh, Bensonwood has three architects on staff. Uh, at least three. At least three. <laughs> okay. And how many engineers? Two engineers, three okay. architects, seven project managers. And an environmental uh, person. Uh, Rhiannon's our energy <laughs> A number of other lead certified <clears throat> people. Mm -hmm. um, we were just FSC certified this summer uh, for a storage trip council. Uh, this, is, this is just, it's, it's so remarkable to me to think about the idea of taking efficiency of scale and applying it to timber frame. Yes. The idea of taking engineered efficiency in terms of energy and, and, and ventilation and things of that nature and applying it to fin timber frame. And it's, it's just exci and it's exciting to think about this because if you think about the, the, the carbon footprint, the en environmental impact, the, the energy inputs that go into the embodied en energy that go into a house and, and here is this house that's built in Leventown or wherever it is that's going to last for 35 years. That's what it's designed to do anyway. Right. And Benson Woods houses are designed to last how long? <laughs> well, at least 100, we would say. Yeah. I would guess that they'd last more like 300. Yeah. That's our think, hope. <laughs> I don't think any of them have been torn down yet. A couple have been moved. Mm -hmm. um, a couple have been moved. <laughs> been moved huh? yeah. <laughs> this but, is like moving a barn. But really, timber framing was kind of the seed of the company, and the company has grown to, uh, again, to find a better way to build. And mm -hmm. so in the, in the 70s and the 80s, uh, Ted and the gang were really involved in the enclosure system and developing the structural insulated panel, the foam core panels, right. continuous wrap of a timber frame, as opposed to what would maybe have been a more traditional infill panel where you're you're studying up between the actually I think the like traditional thing that I'm used to is you build the timber frame you put on the sheathing you and then you you cover the whole thing with corn husks yes <laughs> <laughs> well, why don't we get one, into yeah. something here a little bit basic for people like me what's the what <coughs> exactly is timber frame as opposed to stick built housing yep well timbers are by definition pieces of wood that are five inches or bigger in cross-section so five by five is what a timber is. Um, or more. Or more, so yeah. okay. eight, five by 10. Um, and stick framing is um, two by, two by four, two by six, two by eight, where timber framing is a much more historical uh, method of, of building. 
It was brought over with the colonists from the, from the great cathedrals in Europe. Um, but as the sawmills and the technology developed and the, the source of the timbers got smaller and, and less structurally capable, um, really stick framing developed as a simple, cheap way to, to deliver houses um, to the masses here in this country. Which worked. Which works, yeah. but it was not very energy efficient um, or easy or easy to retrofit. A lot of houses, as you said, get torn down after 30 years and, mm -hmm. and that material gets thrown in the landfill. But it's okay because they were never very good to begin with. It's not okay because of the amount of the amount of embodied energy. Right. And it's not okay because of the amount of energy that they lose being heated. Right. Right. But timbers have, have changed a lot in the last forty years. Um, timbers when Ted started were largely solid sawn um, trees, big trees, or salvaged out of old mills that were built from big trees. Um, whereas now, there's a lot of new wood technology, adhesive technology, and fastener technology that um, allow us to build up timbers out of smaller dimension material. Um, I have a, so the tree, the timbers are now laminated? Uh, well, they can be. We yeah. can still source solids on timbers. Yeah. Um, but in terms of the forestry aspects of things, it's, it's a little more sustainable to use the fast-growing small diameter trees and glue them into uh, structural members that are bigger. I, what I want to do, Chris, because we're, we're running down to about, what, about four minutes left? Um, I, I want to I bring this into a wrapped up okay. thing for the end of the program, and you can leave that there. <laughs> but but then we're going to launch this again so that we've got a full program that's just dealing with how timber framing and and so forth is is right. uh, an energy efficient way you to go. You got a slideshow for us. Well, I, I did got bring a slideshow, slide but let's cool. wrap up with um, yeah what Rhiannon does for our company. Okay, that'd be cool, my Rhiannon. Uh, so my my official title at Benswood is the Energy and Sustainability Specialist. Well, I thought you were the nerd. Um, I, I do refer to myself as the on-staff energy nerd or the okay. energy. <laughs> um, but but basically, what what I'm doing is I'm I'm looking at the building shells that we produce uh, that are already very efficient, uh, but are just looking at ways to make them more efficient. Work with the site that people are dealing with with, with people's budgets, uh, so that they're getting the best return on investment for the mm -hmm. money that they're going to spend. Um, yeah. And I, I want to mention before the hour is out, sure. Benson Woods' traditional approach is rather expensive, but there's a there's a division of the company that is is addressing that and coming up mm -hmm. with houses that are affordable for ordinary people who want to have a house built. Yeah, uh, we launched uh, Unity Building Technologies. Uh, we'll be celebrating its two year anniversary in about a week. Um, we we have at least six or seven that are already built and another six or seven in the pipeline. Uh, and, and the business model with that was triple glaze windows, great insulation, airtight building, um, you know, water sens sensible fixtures, mm -hmm. uh, low energy electrical fixtures and appliances uh, with an idea that someone could put up a unity home, uh, put a six to eight kilowatt uh, PV array on the roof and, you know, go completely net zero. That is impressive. And one of the things that I really like about this is I've looked at the designs of the Unity Homes. Mm -hmm. There's a very limited number of designs. There is. And that's one of the ways that the costs are cut. Exactly. But one of the things that's really beautiful about this is you can take one design and make two homes out of it and be absolutely unaware of the fact exactly. that they're the same design. <laughs> there, are, there are multiple factors uh, that allow you to customize these homes that don't make them like your typical prefab that you would think where they do look similar. Um, even though we like to keep our exterior walls and window placements the same, um, the interior floor plan is, is, is somewhat adjustable within that. So, uh, you know, if you would prefer a larger bedroom here and a smaller bedroom there, we can totally do that. Okay, we're going to, I think we're going to wrap this up. Okay, Tom? Sounds like About, a, Yeah. Sounds like and a plan. so what we're going to do is we're going to say goodbye to everybody who's been watching the Energy News, and we're going to invite them to watch this other show that will hopefully be on BCTV Channel 8, in which we talk about is really what I find very exciting system of homes and uh, and talk about some of the things that Ted Benson and his gang have have done in the last uh, 40 years. 
So at this point in time, we will say goodbye. 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 We spin and we turn. We work all day. Sewing and reaping, we store goods away. So we can be dressed well on the day that we die.